What if I told you that $5.85 would change your life? This is not an infomercial, I promise. I'm not selling you anything. But I want to let you know that the reason that I'm standing here in front of you today is all because of $5.85. Back when we first got started with our organization, we were just a group of friends that would go out to lunch every Friday. Sit down, have lunch, and it was four of us. And we'd rotate between who got to pick where we were going to lunch that day. Now, we all work jobs, so usually where we went was fast food places. We were at McDonald's, we were Burger King, we were Wendy's, we were Zaxby's. We had to get in, we had to get out. We had to keep it moving. Lunch was only an hour. But we had this one friend that every time it was his turn to pick, and he worked the same job as the rest of us, he always took us to some non-chain restaurant, and it was always sit down, place your order, wait on them to bring you your order, eat your food, wait for them to come back and remember to give you your check, and then leave and pay. Now remember, all we have is an hour. So after a while, it got to the point where, you know what? We can't keep doing this. We keep coming back late for lunch. I got bills to pay. I can't lose my job. Follow behind y'all every day, every Friday. Coming home, uh, coming back from work late for lunch. So we're like, look, we can't do those sit-down restaurants anymore like that. So he was like, okay, cool. So what do you do? Every time it was his turn to pick, Chinese restaurant, buffet. Now, I'm not sure if y'all familiar with uh, Two Notch Road. Y'all know what the Big Lots is? Okay, well, this Chinese restaurant used to be right next to the Big Lots, behind the Dunkin' Donuts, where Kiki's Chicken and Waffles used to be before they moved further up the road. We did this restaurant probably sometimes three times a month, every Friday, religiously. Always having lunch together. Just the four guys hanging out, talking. And, guys, I'm going to reveal a few of our secrets. I hope y'all don't mind. I won't tell them the good stuff, but I'm going to let them know. I know there's ladies in the room. But during our lunch, we talk about things guys like to talk about. Guys, you know what we like to talk about. We're talking about sports. We're talking about cars. We're talking about the ladies. We're talking about what's going on in our lives as fathers. We're talking about the ladies. I mean, just the normal guy conversation. And it's always happening at this Chinese restaurant over and over again. It's Friday. Where are we going for lunch this week? Whose turn is it to pick? Oh, it's your turn? We're going to the Chinese restaurant. Now, this Chinese restaurant in particular, I think, used to be a department store before it was a Chinese restaurant. So it's huge inside. It's massive. And it was never filled. You could go there any time of day, and it was always an open table. You never had to wait. You'd sit down. They'd come and say, uh, you having the buffet? He's like, well, what else y'all got? Yeah, we're having the buffet. They'd bring you a drink. you go get your food. You sit down. There's no wait. Your ticket's already there because you're having the buffet. They know how much that costs. Write that up. Leave it on your table. When you're ready to go, you come back. So we'd sit down at the table two, three times a month, having those regular conversations that guys normally have. And the conversations, again, you know, things guys talk about, always came up, but somehow our conversations always came back to manhood. How were we carrying ourselves as men? How were we handling our responsibilities? Was there some young man out there that we knew or were a close relationship to that was not handling things the way that they should be handling things in their life? Did you grow up with the father? Did you not grow up with the father? What was your situation? During our conversations, we realized that we grew up different ways. Some of us grew up with our parents in the home, both parents, father and mother, very engaged in our lives. Some of us grew up without a father. Some of us grew up without a mother. Some of us grew up with mother and father, but the father was not engaged. She was home, but he wasn't present, if you know what I mean. So through those conversations, if we understand the difference in our backgrounds, we learn that, yeah, 
we all had a different path to get here, but the common theme was there was a man along the way who cared enough for us to show us the direction that we should go in. So we're talking and talking, we're having these conversations, we keep coming back to manhood. How are you handling these issues in your life as a man? And my partner Mike, who couldn't be here today, unfortunately he had uh, other work obligations, but he's always kind of the one who gets stuff started in more than one way. <laughs> sometimes he gets the idea started, sometimes he gets the argument started. And if he was standing here, I'd say the same exact thing and he'd know it to be true. But Mike made the statement one day that, you know what? We might be together for a reason. We keep having these conversations. We keep talking about these same things. We keep coming back to these same points and issues in our lives. So Mike had the idea. He thought, we should do something to help other young men who don't have this example in their life. And that was the spark that began our organization, Board of Directors. And we'd have those conversations. We're like, yeah, we should do something. We got an idea. Let's, let's start something. Let's help other young men so that they can get on path where they need to go in their lives and not fall doing the same things a lot of other young men are out here doing. So we talked and talked. And the first idea was that we were going to make ties because young men – if they can dress better, they feel better about themselves, we can make them affordable, we can make them readily available, they can be prepared for interviews. But see, the thing about making ties is that somebody got to know how to sew. Somebody got to have some money to buy some material. Somebody got to know somebody with a sewing machine. That idea didn't really phase out. But the next idea was you know what, maybe we should take our experiences and write them in a book. And at first, Mike was against it. Now, if you ever meet Mike, he is a huge talker, loves to talk. Mike would talk to that chair sitting in the corner right now if he could. <laughs> Mike has no problem meeting a stranger. He will engage anybody in the conversation. He will talk, he will talk, he will talk. This same person who likes to talk all the time said, I don't know if I can write a book. The rest of us were like, hey, man, just write down what you would say. We'll correct the grammar later on. Don't worry about all that. So we convinced him to write a book. And then our lunch conversations began to, to ro rotate around. All right, how are we going to write this book? Who's writing what chapter? Who's doing this? What's the title? What's the cover going to look like? Those would be the lunch conversations that we would have every day at this Chinese restaurant. And when we were done with our buffet meal, we take our ticket, we walk to the register, we hand the ticket to the cashier, and she would tell us that'll be $5.85. Without a doubt, the conversations, the ideas that sparked in this Chinese restaurant are the reason why I'm standing here in front of you today. That was the genesis of our dream. It was nothing more than a thought. It was nothing more than an idea. It began from a conversation, and someone saying one thing leads to another thing, leads to something else. And before you know it, we had an idea, we had a thought. And that thought was so powerful that it brought me to this very moment. Now, I know I keep harping on $5.85. And I know for the most part it seems insignificant. $5.85, that's cheap, that's nothing. I got $5.85 in my couch cushion. I probably got that much in change in my ashtray in my car, right? Probably don't come with ashtrays no more. I'm showing my age right now. I apologize. <laughs> they don't even have cigarette lighters no more. They have AC adapters. <laughs> That's another story for another time. <laughs> but just like that $5.85 seems trivial, it seems minute, it seems small, so is a thought. Understand, a thought is no larger than the brain cell that occupies it. That's it. It's small. Chances are, since you've been in here, you probably had several thoughts. Man, that dude looks sharp in that suit. I wonder what he's gonna talk about. Hope this don't last too long. 
He telling the joke. He ain't funny. Everybody has thoughts. They're easy. They come cheap. They're dime a dozen. You thinking one thing right now, two seconds later, you might be thinking about something else. But don't discount that thought because it's small. Because that thought could be the genesis of something that's far greater than you can even imagine. I want y'all to understand that when you dream, when you think about your future, where you want to go, who you want to be, the things you want to accomplish, then it all starts with a single thought. This building that we are sitting in right now, at one point, did not exist. And before the construction even began, somebody had a thought to build a school on this land. When this program got started today, you all looked at the list and thought, I think I'll go to that one. Thoughts can be small. But have no doubt that they can be the one thing that propels your life into a certain direction. Do not discount your thoughts. This country was founded over 200 years ago because a bunch of old guys got together and thought, hey, we don't want to be part of Great Britain anymore. We want to secede. We want to separate ourselves and create a new union from a thought. Look at where we are so many years later. All it was was a thought. Understand, your thoughts can be small, but have no doubt that they have the power to change your world and the world of others. So, now that we've had this thought, okay, we're talking, we're talking, we got an idea, we know what we want to do. The next thing we have to do is a strategy. Now, what you see here is an actual agenda that we created where we created that? We had this meeting at the Chinese buffet. Look, that Chinese buffet, if it was still open, I might have to go in there just for the sake of reminiscing. It means that much to who we are and why we started doing this thing we started doing, all right? But yeah, four guys who decided on their own to start something would write out an agenda for a meeting at a restaurant at lunch from their regular job to accomplish the dream that they set out to accomplish. Yes, it's that serious. It is absolutely that serious. You may think, why do I need to write out a strategy? Why do I need a plan? Your plan is what's going to start to put into motion that single thought that you have. It is the beginning of the process of going from a thought to a tangible item. You have to have a strategy. You have to have a plan. You have to lay it out. I want you to understand, just as we said before with this building, it began from a thought. But after that thought, somebody had to devise a plan. There were probably trees here. We got to get a plan to get these trees out of the way. Somebody had a thought. OK, it should be this big. All right, let's write up a blueprint. Let's start to build this foundation. Let's start to build this building. Your strategy is going to lay out and map the future as to how you're going to make this thought happen. So when we talk about a strategy, I want you to understand there are four main components that we're talking about in a strategy, OK? Now, I'm sure everybody in here has probably taken an English class before, right? So you know about interrogative questions. Let me pull back. Interrogative questions. Y'all know what they are. You may not have heard them called that before, but it's who, what, when, where, why, how. You know interrogative questions. You know it's the questions that you ask when you're trying to get somebody to talk. Now, when I'm talking to my son, he's very quiet. So if I ask him, you know, hey, you okay? You know what his answer is, right? Yeah. And that's it. That's a closed-ended question. Are you okay? Yes. In the conversation. But if I ask him, what was the best part about school today? He won't say too much, but he'll think. He'll say, uh, I'd probably say it was lunch and recess. 
Okay, we get somewhere. We can have a conversation. We can open it up a little bit. Interrogative questions are going to help you answer why, who, what, when, how. I probably left one out, but that's cool. Let's go with it. All right, so your strategy. First thing we're going to begin with is the who. Easy. We know who it is. The who is you. You are the who. That's not a problem. We got that one out of the way, easy, off the top. The next one is what. What do you want to accomplish? What is your dream? What is your goal? What do you want to be? What do you want to have? A lot of times we set out to do things, we have these thoughts, and we have these goals, and we have these ideas. The answer to that what question can come easy. A lot of times when I talk to middle school age kids, I ask them, what do you want to accomplish in your life? One of the number one answers we get in the response is, I want to be a football player. I want to be a basketball player. That's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. I don't knock them for that because they're young. They haven't been exposed to as much as y'all have. They, they don't know as much about life. They don't know much about the world. They see the things that are popular. They're kind of drawn to that, and that's cool. But for you all, I hope that you would think a little bit deeper. And if you still have dreams of becoming a basketball player, a football player, that's fine. I'm not knocking those. Please don't get it twisted. Don't, don't, don't think I'm here to kill your dream. I'm not. I'm here to help your dream evolve. All right? My dream was to play in, in the NBA. I stopped growing probably about 11th grade, it seems like. I couldn't even hit six foot. Now, that's not necessarily a barrier, but when you tell your mom that you want to go to basketball practice to try out, and she was like, nah, I don't think we would be able to do that. That kind of puts a damper on how these whole NBA things going to work out. All right? Plus, I can't shoot. So, <laughs> you can have a dream, but think about what that goal is. Think deeply about it. Really put some thought into it. It may be easy just to name something off the top of your head, but think about it. Some of you may want to become business professionals. You may dream of starting your own business. Some of you may want to make music for a living. That's fine. Whatever your dream is, make sure that it is clearly defined, okay? So the who is you, the what is whatever your dream or goal is. The next question is when. When do you want to have this thing by? The thing I want you all to understand is that we are all adults here. We've probably completed the majority of our schooling. If not, we're close to it. So I'm going to take it back to kindergarten for y'all real quick. How many days of the week are there? Seven. They are Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. There's no day of the week called some day. There is no day of the week called some day. Some day may never come. Your dream should have a deadline. You should have a definitive time frame in which you want to accomplish this thing you're setting out to accomplish. If you say, someday I want to own a big old house, <clears throat> what's the chances of that happening? How do you know when you get there? If I say, by the end of 2018, I want to move out of where I'm currently living, and I want to move into a house twice the size, I know I got until December 31st to make that thing happen, right? Okay. Be definitive. Set a deadline. We got any football fans in here? Okay, all right. How long is the football game? How many quarters is it divided into? I gave you an answer when I said quarter. Just go with it. All right. Four quarters. How long is a quarter? 12 minutes or 15? Okay, let's go with 12. I heard 12 in the audience. A football game is 
four quarters long. Each quarter is 12 minutes long. So that's 48 minutes. I did mental math there. Okay. 48 minutes. So the thing about that football game is that when that 48 minutes runs out, what happens? The game is over. Time is up. If you had not accomplished your goal by the time those 45 minutes run, uh, 48 minutes run out, guess what? It's done. Well, if you're tired. If you're tired, it's overtime. I'm going to tell you this. Ain't no guarantee overtime in life. <laughs> There's no guarantee of overtime. We're not guaranteed another second on this life, in this life. All right? So be definitive. When that time frame that you set for yourself runs out, you should know whether you've hit that goal or whether you've fallen short. Okay? So who? Who is you? What is your goal? When? Your time frame. Be definitive. There's no day of the week called someday. Next, I want to talk about the why. Why is in the middle of all this, but I'd say it's the most important. Now, why will help you answer the question, why do I want this dream to come true? Why do I want this dream to be a reality? Why? That's a hard question. Because if I say I want to be a professional football player in three years from now, and my answer to why is because I want to make a lot of money, Okay, my response to the money answer as to why is how much money is enough money? And there's only one answer to that question. Does anybody know it? It is not, but there's technically an answer to that question. How much money is enough money? I'm sorry? Insufficient? When you're sufficient? Okay. Let's get a little bit a little bit closer to the answer. How much money is enough money? You want to know how much money is enough, mo is enough money? More money. More money. How much money is enough? More. I'll tell you, real talk. About two years ago, I got a promotion on my job. Oh, man. I was hyped. It was a significant increase in pay. I started being able to afford things I couldn't afford before. I started being able to go places I couldn't go before. I had more money. I've had more money for about two years now. Guess what? I want more money. That why wasn't good enough. If I just wanted to get a promotion just to get more money, see how it evaporated in the span of two years? I've got more. Now what do I want? More. Tie your why to something that's infinite. Tie your why to something that is infinite. One of the favorite answers I get from young people who, you know, the middle school age crowd of guys that we usually talk to, when I ask them, why do you want to do this thing you set out to do? Why do you want to be a, a famous rapper? Why do you want to be a basketball player? Not that I'm questioning their judgment about their goal, but I want them to think, why is it that I want this thing? And every now and then, you'll have a young man who will tell you, I want to make my mama proud. That's, that's incredible. That's amazing to have the advanced vision to say, I'm doing this thing. I'm setting out to accomplish this thing, not so much for me, but for somebody else. Tie your why to something that's infinite. <laughs> Don't tie your why to something that can run out or something that can't ever be filled because you'll constantly be working to try to fill that why all over again. The other thing about the why that I want y'all to understand is that when things get difficult, and they will because they always do, because that's how life operates, when they get hard, when it feels like you can't go on, you got to draw on that why. And what I mean is by draw on that why, it's just like a, a bank account. If I'm going to the store and I know I need some money, I might need to go draw on my account 
so I have money to do this thing. When times get difficult, times get hard, you're going to have to draw on that why. And if that why isn't strong enough, what happens at this point? People quit. They didn't really want to do it. They were just in it for the fame. They were in it for the money. They were in it for that thing that, you know, ultimately down the road in the long run is not going to make a huge difference. When times get difficult, and they will, you'll have to draw on your why. And if your why is not strong, that may be the end of your dream right there. So, who? Who is you? What? The what is your goal? When? The when is your time frame. Your why. Why do I want to do this? What's my motivation? What's going to keep me going when the going gets rough? The last step I want to talk to you about is how. How are you going to make this thing happen? Now, if my goal is to leave here and stop by Popeye's on the way home, which is probably what I'm going to do, <laughs> it might not happen maybe two or three steps to that. How am I going to make that happen? I'm going to sit in my car. I'm going to crank it up. I'm going to put it in drive. I'm going to drive until I arrive at Popeye's drive through and I'm going to tell the lady that I would like a two-piece dark spicy with a biscuit and red beans and rice. Please. Damn. Breakfast is gone, man. Breakfast is through. That cup of coffee is it, about that much of it left in my stomach right now. But yeah, that's that's easy, right? That's basic. That's that's minor. But that's how I'm gonna do it. Those are the steps. Now we can get more detailed in that I need to make sure I got gas in the car. I want to make sure that my tires are good. But I mean, come on, I got here. I can probably get pop out. No problem. If your goal is to become a doctor, that might take a little bit more. I had, what, five steps in my how to get to Popeyes? Your how to get to be a doctor may have 600. Don't compare your how to somebody else's how. Don't compare your goal to somebody else's goal. They can't work it. They can't do it like you do. Key element in everything that you do, every goal that you started to accomplish, is you. You are the secret ingredient. So don't compare what you're doing to somebody else's plan, okay? Your how may be six steps or 600. That's up to you to figure out. That's you to determine. I can't tell you that if you want to do this thing, it's going to take you this many steps because I'm not you. You are you. And only you can tell yourself what it's going to take to actually get you from A to B. All right? So understand, people can contribute to your how. They can have input. They can tell you, hey, man, when I was doing this, this is what worked for me. That's cool. You can take that input. But understand, who's going to have to put in the work is you. Okay? So to recap, who? You. What? The goal. When? Your time frame. Why? Your motivation. How? How you're going to get it done. I know you're not supposed to use the word in definition, but... Y'all understand. Yes, ma'am. The where? The where can also be the what. Because not all the time will your goal be what I want to be, but maybe where I want to go. My wife wants to go to Paris. So the goal for her is a where. The how is I can find money. <laughs> That's one of the biggest steps in my how. How are we going to make this thing happen? Also, how are we going to get this person who barely likes flying, to fly across nothing but water to get to where she wants to go. My how, got a lot of steps in it. But yes, your where can be a replacement for your what. 
what do I want to be, what do I want to have, what do I want to accomplish, could be just as well replaced with where do I want to go. It's a good question. I appreciate it. All right. So have a plan. It's important. Now, I touched on this briefly when wrapping up the plan, but it's important to connect with the right people also. Remember, I told you, sometimes you'll have people who can contribute, can help, can point out the right direction, but you want to make sure that you got the right people connected with you. You want to make sure that you are in contact with people who can actually have a positive impact and not a negative one. I want to tell you all a, a little bit about how we began and how we actually came up with the name, the Board of Directors. Now, we're all four guys working at the same company, and we meet for lunch on every Friday. And one of the things we do on Wednesdays is that we go to this church that's right down the road from the job. It was called the Meeting Place of uh, Meeting Place Church of Columbia. And they had this midweek service called Power Lunch. And it was just an hour long. It'd be a, a short devotional, a sermonette. Maybe they have a sermon for like 20 minutes or so. And then at the end, they feed you. And it was, you know, pizza, bananas, apples. Nothing, you know, you're not getting a five-course meal. But they're like, hey, we appreciate you coming out. Thank you for listening. Get a little bit of word in your life. Here's something so that you can actually get back to work and not be starving for the rest of the day because you spent your lunch time with us. And we appreciate that. Now, of course, being that we were coming from work to go to these power lunch sessions, we'd be dressed like we were coming from work. We'd have on shirts, ties, slacks, hard bottom shoes, and whatnot. And we'd be sitting around the table, and just like we were at the Chinese restaurant, we'd be talking about business, we were talking about, okay, how are we going to make this dream happen? We'd be doing the same thing on Wednesdays at power lunch. We'd be sitting around the table, hey, man, you finished writing your chapter yet? No, I finished writing mine. I got about a couple more paragraphs. Yo, what's the cover going to look like? I don't know. I don't really have any ideas. I barely know how to use Photoshop. We're going to make this thing happen. Those are conversations. We're talking business. Everywhere we go, we're talking business. And there was a gentleman there who saw us talking business, wearing our shirts and ties and our hard bottoms. Like, hey, man, y'all look like a board of directors. Y'all over there talking some serious stuff. And we were like, yeah, I kind of like that. And the name stuck. Now, in the process of having those conversations at Power Lunch, the pastor there, uh, his name was Anthony Dix Jr., he would come sometimes and sit at the table and talk to us and engage us in conversation. And as we began to develop a relationship with him, he would drop some wisdom on us every now and then. And we'd tell him about what we were doing, and he'd say, oh, that's awesome. How can I help any way I can? I want to be a part of this. You guys are great. I appreciate y'all coming out. And in turn, he would have conversations with us about what was going on in his life. And we would be like, yeah, man, I understand. I'm going through the same thing. This is what I'm doing. It was a symbiotic relationship. We were growing each other. We were investing in each other. We were having conversations that were fruitful and productive. And it was important that we have those. Because along the way, when things got rough or we ran into an issue with what we were trying to accomplish, we had somebody that we could rely on, someone who was trustworthy, someone who was engaged, somebody who actually wanted to see us succeed. I consider him a friend to this day. And so much that when it was time to actually publish our book, we needed somebody to read it and review it and write a little write-up for the back of the book. It's called a blurb. We need a blurb on the back. We need somebody to say, you know what? This is good work. I endorse this. I put my name behind it. And when it was time to do that, Pastor Anthony was the one who stepped up and followed through for us. And I appreciate him to this day for that. It made a tremendous difference. It validated us to a certain audience. And it was important to us accomplishing our dream. It helped us accomplish our goal because we connected with the right person. It's that important. But if you connect with the wrong person, it can be just as detrimental. There was a guy who I will not name. I won't be messy, I promise. We shared our dream with him. Now, looking back in hindsight, 
we didn't have the level of relationship with him that we had with Pastor Anthony. And it probably wasn't a good idea to share our dream with him because ultimately there was not going to be a positive outcome to that relationship and sharing that dream. Understand, your dream is like your baby. When I brought my first son home from the hospital, I could just, it was all, I could just sit there and stare at him all day long. He was so innocent, so vulnerable, and he had to be protected. And that was my job. Your dream is your baby, especially when it gets started for the first time. It's new, it's innocent, it's vulnerable. You have to protect it. You can't just throw your baby in every, everybody's arms. Everybody is not suited to take care of your baby. Your dream is your baby. Y'all know some people in here right now, you would not leave your child alone just for three minutes. Some of them might be related to you. You can't share your dream with everybody. You can't share your baby out there with everybody in the world. They're not going to protect it and love it like you would. But we shared our dream with this particular person. And I'll never forget this conversation ever in my life. I'm all happy. We're starting to write the chapters. We're making things happen. We're getting work done. We're like, man. I walked up to him and was like, hey, man. Me and my friends, we're writing a book. We're going to help young men get their lives on track. We're going to change lives. We're going to make this thing happen. We're going to make a difference in the world. And I'll never forget the exact response he said. He said, who are y'all to write a book? Don't nobody know y'all. Yeah. You ever turn the shower water on and you jump in before it get warm? Mm -hmm. And that cold water just slap you in the face? That's what that statement did. It wake you up. It gets your day started all right. I'll tell you that. Who are y'all to write a book? Don't nobody know y'all. What? I'm hurt. Now understand, I want to go back to what I talked about in the strategy. Your why. What's your motivation? If your why is weak in that moment, you're done. You're over. You're finished. There's nothing else left for you. You're packing it up. You're going home. I'm through with this thing. He's right. I'm wrong. Don't nobody know me. I'm not writing this book. Game over. If your why is strong, and ours was, you'll keep going. Our why was to make a difference in the lives of young men. That why kept us going. And I'm thankful we have that why. Because it was important to our lives in accomplishing our goal. But if it was weak, that would have been the end. Right there on that spot where I stood all excited, sharing my dream with somebody I shouldn't have to trust in three minutes in the room by themselves with. Your dream is your baby. You can't share it with everybody. They don't know how to love it like you do. They don't know how to care for it like you do. They don't know how to develop it and grow it like you do. Make sure that you are sharing your dream with people who will help you go forward. Okay? Action. Now, we talked a little bit about having a thought. Having a thought is pretty easy. Everybody can do it. I'm sure y'all have had several since y'all have been in here. Next, you got to have a strategy. Okay. And that's nothing more than say, okay, I'm going to take these thoughts and I'm going to put them in order and make me a plan. That's all it is. You also have to connect with the right people, which is cool. You just got to go out there and talk about your dream. Here's my plan. This is what I want to do. Relatively easy. Most people can do that. Most people do. You know where most people get stopped at? Action. I'm going to tell you all a story. It doesn't necessarily have to relate directly to the board of directors, but it is absolutely an appropriate illustration for what I want you to understand. I have a 10-year-old son named Cameron. Cameron is a very smart young man. 
loves video games, loves to draw, uses all my printer paper on all his little drawings. I love him. And also, if you ever want to know how annoying you can really be, have a child that actually looks like you. <laughs> promise you. It'll make you look at yourself different, I promise you. But Cameron is my guy. I love him. My firstborn. Big old brown eyes just staring at me when he was first born. Like, what you going to do now? Huh? It got real, Pops. <laughs> it was real. I love him. The camera's 10 years old, and he has chores to do, which is, you know, a normal thing for a child his age. He should have some sort of responsibilities around the house. You can't get out there earning money. You should help us keep the house clean. Cool. So Cameron, first thing, he has to keep his room clean which is just a given. I don't really count that as a chore. That's your responsibility. That goes without saying. Your living space, your personal area should be clean. That's my expectation as a parent. But throughout the house, I asked Cameron to do three things. Empty the trash cans when they are full. Easy. Empty the recycle bin when it's full. Easy. When we run out of Kool-Aid, make some more. I mean, you're drinking it all anyway. You make some more Kool-Aid, bro. We were out here and killed all the bottles of water waiting on you to make more Kool-Aid. Okay? So that's his three responsibilities, his primary job duties. If he does that, I give him a whole five dollars. Yeah, big time. My life is going up for that in like a dollar. And I don't think it went up until I got to high school. But... He only gets that $5 if I don't have to remind him to do his chores. Seems like a fair deal, right? That's not asking too much. The trash can is full. I got to step on it and push it down in there to get anything else in there. You might want to take that out. The recycle bin is so full that I'm starting to stack things next to it. All you got to do, open the door, flip the lid, dump it out, bring it back in the house. It literally does not take one minute to empty the recycle bin. Make some Kool-Aid. You're thirsty. May as well. You drink it all. Get to it. But y'all know what happens, right? <laughs> you sound like you've been through this before. I'm, am I, I'm taking a peek into your life. <laughs> I'm not looking forward to those years at all. When they are getting closer, we'll be 11 in June. But y'all know what happens. Cameron. Come down here and empty this trash. You see it's full, right? Cameron, I can't stack this piece of bottle any taller and empty the recycle bin. Cameron, we done killed all the bottled water. And the filter is bad and I had gone to the store to change it for the filter from the tap. Make some Kool-Aid. After doing that a couple times, I'm like, okay, we got to come up with something different. So I sat him down and I said, Cameron, you got to come up with a plan to take care of your chores. Like, I can't keep reminding you. I just can't. So he thought about it for a moment, and being the creative child that he is, he's like, dang, I drew a checklist. So I got these three boxes, and I'm going to put it behind this little plastic, and I'm going to check it off with my dry erase marker every day when I do my chores. Go for it, son. Proud of you. What happened? Cameron, come downstairs and empty this trash. Cameron, come downstairs and empty this recycle bin. I thought you had a plan. What happened? You know what happened? I had to sit him back down again, and I explained to him, I was like, Cameron, I'm proud of you for creating a plan that's going to help you accomplish what it is you're supposed to do. But understand this, and this is what I want y'all to understand as well. No idea and no plan will work if you don't. No idea and no plan will work if you don't. One of my favorite sayings, and I say this all the time, especially when I'm, I'm talking to guys in the gym, and they're talking about, man, I don't feel like working out. Man, I don't feel like being here today. My favorite saying is a Chinese proverb, and it says that a man standing on the side of a mountain with his mouth open, waiting for a fish to fall in, will go hungry. You got to go where the fish are. You got to put your line in the water. You got to get those fish out of that water. Otherwise, you're going to go hungry. If you've got a dream, cool. If you've got a plan, even better. 
If you connected yourself with the right people to make that thing happen, that's awesome. But none of that matters if you don't work. What you're looking at here is the result of our work. This picture is actually from our proof when we first finished our book and we're about to get it published. This is the work. This is what we did. This is the action we took to make our dream happen. Understand, no idea will work if you don't. This is the cover. See that, that sticker up there? We photoshopped the sticker from Oprah's book club and put it on the book. We just knew. You couldn't tell us we weren't going to be on Oprah's show. Because this was back when Oprah was still doing her talk show. We knew it was going to happen. We're going to be on Oprah. We're going to write this book. We're going to become stars. This thing's going to blow. We're about to be on the Today, the Today Show, the Tonight Show, Good Morning America, all that. It's going to happen. We sent copies of the book to Steve Harvey. We sent it to Tom Joyner. We sent it to the White House. This thing's going to blow. We know it. That's our plan. Look, we're going to hit these people. We're going to hit these people. We're going to send some over here. This thing's going to happen. Trust me. We're going to knock this thing out. Quite work out that way. Not at all. There was a change of plan. Didn't quite happen like we thought it was. Now, I'm gonna ask a question. Y'all go with me for a minute. How many people, and just raise your hand, how many people got into every college they applied to? Now, if it was just one and you got into that one, you got into every college you applied to, you can raise your hand too. All right, so we got a couple. Cool. Y'all can listen to this, but everybody else in the room, y'all can feel this right here, y'all. Trust me. When you get accepted to college, those of you who have never been rejected, y'all know, or those of you who have been accepted but also been rejected, when you get that envelope in the mail, it's about that big. It's got big, bold letters that says yes on the outside, right? It's got the school mascot, the logo. Man, everybody at the post office know you got into college. Your mailman know you got into college. And anybody who saw the mailman put the mail in your mailbox know you got into college. You can't miss it. Huge envelope. It's about that much paper inside. Yes. For those of you who did not raise your hand just now, and I'm one of those people who could not raise my hand and say that I did get into every college I applied to, Go with me for a minute. Try not to shed tears. What happens when you don't get into the college you applied to? Ooh, 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 ooh. You get that envelope. It's, it's folded. The paper's folded inside. There's one sheet of paper. You don't get a stack. You get one sheet of paper. It comes in an envelope just like a bill. It don't have any logo on the outside. It don't say yes. It don't have nobody with a picture doing a fist pump. None of that. That thing looks like a bill. <laughs> and when you open that envelope, the letter is something like this. Dear so-and-so, thank you for your interest in our university. However, at this time, we are unable to offer you a position in the class of 2000 and whatever it is that you would be if you got accepted in the school. We wish you best of luck on your future endeavors. Sincerely, the school you are not going to ever get into in your dreams. When we sent our book to Barnes & Noble, you know what letter we got back in the mail? It was not that big padded envelope that said yes on the outside. It was that thin, bill-looking, single sheet of paper inside, folded three times, that said, Dear Board of Directors, thank you for your interest in becoming a book that's sold on our shelves at Barnes & Noble. However, at this time, we got enough self-help books. We don't need y'all little self-help books, self-published book that nobody ain't ever heard of. We hope that you continue to be a customer of ours. Sincerely yours, Barnes and Noble. What do you do? What do you do when you have a dream, write out your plan, connect with the right people, put in the hard work to make that thing happen? And then you get rejected and your plan changes. You keep going. 
understand that that change of plans isn't just from outside forces. Sometimes it's going to be things internal. Remember the beginning of this story. I told y'all there was four guys sitting around the lunch table trying to make this thing happen. But then I always keep referring to my partner, Mike. Four turned to two. But we're still here. We're still pushing. We're still going. We're not stopping because our why drives us. But I also want to say that to say this, and this is important, and it's going to hurt when it happens, but inevitably it does in everybody's life. Everybody that comes with you can't go with you. Everybody who comes with you cannot go with you. In the path to accomplish the things you set out to accomplish in your life, to make your dreams a reality, there's going to be some people that you've been cool with for a long time. They're going to look at you differently when you start to accomplish what it is that you accomplished in your life. Everybody that comes with you cannot go with you. All right? So, success. The book is published. We're getting it out there. We're, we started our social media. And we're telling people to check out the book. We're handing it out, selling it, meeting at events, being vendors, getting the names out there a little bit. We accomplished our goal. We set out to write that book, and we made that thing happen. Now what? Repeat. Do it again. The process does not stop. It's a cycle. It's not a destination. It's a journey. All right? Understand that in the process of promoting our book, we got on the radio here in Columbia. There's a radio show called I-95, Don Mills Game. Now, yeah, it wasn't Oprah. It wasn't the Today Show. It wasn't the Tonight Show. It wasn't even Watch Fox News at, at, at 10. It was a radio show. But you couldn't tell us that we hadn't made it. We were happy. We were proud of that moment. We had accomplished what we set out to do. And in the conversation where we're talking to Dawn about our book and telling her what it's about and how it came about and all the things we did to make it happen, there was a listener who was later calling in and said, you know, ask them if they'd be interested in coming to talk to some boys at Sanders Middle School here in Columbia. So when we were heard that, we were like, new idea. We're right back to the beginning. New thought. New idea. How do we make this idea happen? The same way we made this idea happen. We're going to go write out a plan. We're going to connect with the right people. We're going to put in the work, and we're going to make this thing happen. And yes, there will be times along the way where we'll have to run into some roadblocks. But you know what? We're going to do it. And we made it happen. And we would talk to the boys at Sanders Middle School, and every now and then a parent or an administrator would come in and be like, y'all ever thought about uh, like talking to guys outside of, of the school? You know, I got a group at my church that I'd love to speak at. We'd be like, OK, cool. Another idea. So what do we do? Start the process all over again. Have an idea. Make a plan. Work that plan. Connect with the right people. Face your obstacles. Overcome them. Assess, adapt, overcome. I can't state that hard, hard enough. But you make that thing happen. Again. And that's why you see us standing in front of these boys talking to them, teaching them the things that we know. And you know how this started right here? $5.85 at the Chinese restaurant. Your dream may seem small in your mind. It may seem insignificant. It may seem like something that won't make a difference. But I promise you, no matter how great a thing you see in this world, the tallest skyscraper, the biggest and baddest car, the greatest song, it all began with a thought. What's your dream? How are you going to make the thing in your life happen? Ladies and gentlemen, I thank you for your time.
My name is Gerard Rose. My partner is Michael Holloman. We are the board of directors. If you would like to get in contact with us, this is our contact information. It's our email address and phone number. We are also on social media, on Facebook as Board of Directors, as the True Board on Instagram and Twitter. I thank you all for your time. I appreciate you for being a great audience. If you have any questions, I'll be glad to answer those either now or personally after everyone is left. Okay? Anybody? <laughs>